Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Birch, and I'm the president of the National Police Foundation, and I'm your host for today's event. I want to welcome all of you uh, who are watching us live today and all of those who are watching us after today on a recorded session uh, on our YouTube account. Today, we're hosting another conversation in our series designed to reflect our mission as a national organization, advancing policing through science and innovation. These conversations will almost always feature a scientific or a technical finding uh, or an insight or innovation that may help policing leaders in guiding and managing their agencies, may help elected officials and community members gain a deeper insight into policing organizations and policing overall, and to expand our shared knowledge together of what works in policing. As we go along in our conversation today, I'm gonna to invite you to submit your questions on Facebook Live so that we can submit those to our guests um, and have a conversation together with you about the article that we're talking about today. Today's event continues our conversation about reducing unnecessary police use of force. We've heard a lot about policing reforms and various proposals for doing so, some of which are focused on new or enhanced policies or training. According to the research that we're going to be discussing today, and I want to read you a quote from that article, of the litany of recommendations believed to reduce police shootings, five have garnered widespread support. One, body-worn cameras. Two, de-escalation training. Three, implicit bias training. Four, early intervention systems. And five, civilian oversight or review. These highly endorsed interventions, however, are not really supported by a strong body of empirical evidence that demonstrates their effectiveness in the way in which they've been intended most often. You heard that right. They're not supported by a strong body of empirical evidence when it comes to reducing unnecessary use of force, particularly deadly force. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't implement them. There may be other good reasons to explore these interventions, and that's what we're gonna have a conversation about today. The conversation 2020, American Academy of Political and Social Science Annals, Volume 687. The title of that volume is called Fatal Police Shootings, Patterns, Policy, and Prevention. And specifically, Within that volume, a chapter called Moving Beyond Best Practice, Experiences in Police Reform, and a Call for Evidence to Reduce Officer-Involved Shootings. That article was authored by Robin Engel, Hannah McManus, and Gabrielle Isaza. I'm joined today by Professor Engel of the School of Criminal Justice at the University of Cincinnati, and also the director of the IACP University of Cincinnati Center for Police Research and policy. Dr. Engel has a very long history and a great reputation as a partner and a collaborator with practitioners, as well as a very accomplished career as a scholar and academic leader. We're also joined today by Chief Maris Harold of the Boulder Police Department, in fact, Boulder's first female chief. Chief Harold has 23 years of experience with the Cincinnati Police Department and holds a bachelor's degree in sociology and a master's degree in criminal justice. Chief Harold began her career in social work and has received extensive recognition for her work in leading problem solving initiatives, as well as community collaboration and police reform efforts as well. In fact, Chief Harold received the Herman Goldstein Award, I believe in 2017, for her work around problem oriented policing, which we find particularly impressive. So Professor uh, Engel, we'll start off with you. One of the things we like to do at the beginning of these conversations, just sort of set the context, is to tell our guests a little bit about the article, in this case, the chapter um, that we're gonna be talking about, how you came up with the framework for this article um, and, what, and what led you to these topics specifically. Great, well, thank you um, and welcome to everyone. And Chief Harold, wonderful to see you again, even though it's uh, remote. Congratulations on your new appointment out there in Boulder. They got a fabulous chief, and I'm sure the community will be very proud of all the work that you're going to do out there. So, um, so congratulations to you and welcome. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't note that one of my partner agencies, the Tulsa Police Department, I've worked with them for many years. 
um, and none of the Tulsa police officers will be watching this event live today because they are getting ready to uh, provide final services for uh, a police sergeant, Craig Johnson, who was killed in the line of duty. And I bring that up because when we talk about the need to reduce officer-involved shootings, obviously there's two parts to that equation. One is reducing the unnecessary death of citizens, but also making these encounters safer for our officers. And that's exactly the position that I found myself in when I uh, accepted a position to take over the Cincinnati Police Division. Uh, and that was after a, a fatal police encounter in 2015. And I was really confident uh, in my abilities uh, because I had this research background. I thought most certainly I'd be able to come in and put in place evidence-based reform. And I was really surprised at the lack of evidence that existed when I went to make those changes. Um, I went back to my core, you know, as a researcher, we need this evidence, we need to know uh, which are the best strategies to move forward, and the evidence just wasn't there. So when I uh, implemented a lot of the reform changes that people are talking about right now, and I did that um, in partnership with some really great folks at the University of Cincinnati Police Division, including Chief Harrell, uh, we did that based on what we could find at the time and unfortunately sometimes had to rely on our gut instinct about what would be the best uh, best uh, reforms to put forward. And I don't want police executives to be in that situation again. We as a research community need to come together and we need to work rapidly and we need to build an evidence base so that we can make these encounters with citizens safer. Uh, and so I pledged uh, my time and that of my research team to actually look into where there are gaps in research and what we need to do to fill them. So that was part of my writing of this particular piece was just to highlight that gap that exists and to really forcefully stress to our research community, our police practitioner community, our philanthropic community, our federal and state funders, that we need to build this body of evidence because lives depend on it. Yeah. So I feel passionately about it, as you can tell. Well, that's great. Thank you, Professor. And, and we all need to feel passionately about it uh, because it, it's never been more critical today than to do what we know is actually going to make a difference, right? We can't go through what we've been going through over the last few weeks. We've got to fix this. Um, and evidence is the key to that. So I, I want to talk a little bit more about this article before we jump into some of the, the real discussion. This was published in early 2020, January 2020. So I assume the writing on this was probably done back in the fall of the, of the year. Um, but what you say in the article is that a review of the evidence around body-worn cameras specifically, changes to use of force policies, de-escalation, implicit bias training, early intervention systems and civilian oversight or review boards reveals, quote, a patchwork of studies that collectively provide little confidence that these reforms will directly impact police shootings. And let me just pause for a minute and be really clear about that for anybody who's watching that may be from the community. What we're saying here, we're not saying that there's no evidence that these interventions provide any benefit. And we're not saying that they shouldn't be implemented. What we're saying here and what the author has, has said here specifically is that there's little confidence that these interventions specifically will directly impact police shootings. So this is a very important point and a key aspect, we think, of understanding what science and the evidence actually says about police interventions. Now, later in the article, you say, quote, it cannot be said with confidence that the proposed use of force reforms can prevent further fatal police citizen encounters. Is there an example, Professor, um, in any profession, any country, any state, at any time, when a change in a policy or even changes in multiple policies or practices have enabled us to prevent a tragic outcome? In an aviation and medical practice, um, both of which um, you, you think about it, they, they really have 
uh, an admirable uh, approach to learning and training and bringing science to practice, we still have tragedies in those domains and those professions. So how can we help people understand today uh, that this isn't just about a matter of implementing a new training, a new policy, or even eight new policies or, or new trainings? It's about fundamental changes that really have major repercussions on how we do policing. Uh, and we can't make these changes without research and investment. How can we convince people of that? Well, I think it's very obvious that we need a holistic approach. Um, there is some evidence that changes in use of force policy can reduce uses of force. We've seen that over time. Um, you know, there were major policy changes back in the 1980s, and there was a reduction in officer use of force and of killing of civilians. Um, we see now that even, even the term, it can't wait, we are rushing in. And that's not a bad thing in the sense that we need immediate responses. On the other hand, when we when we rush in, we have to recognize that there's possibly unintended consequences as well, and that maybe the reform efforts that we're getting behind and placing our emphasis on aren't maybe the best to get to the outcome that we want. Um, mm -hmm. And the only way that we will know that is if we study it, and we have to study it in real time. I am not suggesting that police departments wait for research. They can't do that. Right. But I am suggesting that right now, as they're making changes, if we were working in partnership and researching these changes along the way, then five years from now, we wouldn't be in the same position. We would know what was working and we'd be able to get behind those initiatives. But I'm afraid that once again, the time will pass us by and in five years, we'll be in the same situation where we're calling for change, but we don't know really what to call for that will have the most impact. So again, it's a plea for us to get out there, be working with our practitioner partners right now and help them make, as they're making decisions about changes in their agency, let's make sure that we're testing those and seeing what the impact is. Yeah, yeah great point. And, and I think another, uh, th another comment that you make in the article is, the decentralized nature of policing in the US, right? We're pretty unique in terms of how we're structured here. We'll make many efforts to reduce officer shootings at the at the national or state level ineffective. Um, and I think we should talk about that for a minute because we often get proposals from um, very well-meaning people in the public and in academia and other places um, that, that wanna make a suggestion about implementing a nationwide training immediately to solve a particular problem. But I don't think most folks understand just how challenging that is given our decentralized structure and just the nature of police work uh, in particular. Can you comment on that? Sure. Uh, you know, right now, we still can't count the number of use of force nationally. We still do not have a federal system that can actually count the number of uses of force. Um, that in and of itself suggests that anything that we try to do at the national or even the state level, we're going to run into impediments. There are going to be challenges. Now, am I saying we should never try to do that? Absolutely not. We should continue to push at the state and federal level. But while we're doing that, we can make real meaningful change at the local level. And citizens intuitively know this. That's why they're protesting outside of their local police department right now. And that's why folks like Keith Carroll are moving forward with really important Form effort. Um, so we know at the local level, we can have immediate impact. Um, we just need to test that impact and then spread it across the rest of the policing field. Yeah, it's a it's a tough spot that that ex executives like uh, Chief Harold and others are, are in, right? To be yeah. in a position where you're forced to act quickly, but may not have what you'd like to have, which is someone telling you this is this is how you address this issue. So Chief, let me turn to you for a minute. Um, the article makes a, a statement that I found pretty interesting and I, I wanna get your take on this. The, the statement uh, says, it is an ethical duty of police officials to combine the implementation of innovative approaches with continuous review and testing to identify ineffective practice and unintended consequences. Do you think this is an idea that many uh, in the sort of ranks of, of police executives and policing generally accept or even understand? 
so to answer the first part of your question, yes, I definitely think it's it's it has to be an ethical decision by police executives across the country. Um, unfortunately, um, I've been present when Dr. Engel and other researchers have given presentations on the lack of evidence to support uh, de-escalation training, for example, and the reaction from the police chiefs across the country were they had no idea there was not evidence. Yeah. And so there's a huge disconnect, right? There's a huge disconnect there. And we have to fill that gap. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and you know, it's easier said uh, than done, obviously. You're, you're, you're scrambling for answers, for solutions. And here we are telling you that it's your ethical responsibility to measure it, right? Um, as if anybody yeah. had time in the middle of a crisis to measure what they're doing. But that's essentially what we're saying really has to be done. I, I want to throw another one your way. And, um, you know, as I thought about the article and, and read through it, um, and when it comes to, to policy and training interventions, such as de-escalation, for example, or even implicit bias training, um, even if the evidence isn't there, or if it isn't overwhelming in terms of how you intend to use it, that is what it is you're intending to change, do most chiefs feel like they really have a choice uh, or do they just sort of have to implement these approaches and, and hope for the best, not just for perception purposes, but to hope that it actually makes some changes? Yeah, I think police chiefs across the country when we have these types of crises um, really feel compelled to, to take a best practice and implement it. I think what Dr. Engel is bringing to the table is I think that if you're aware of these concepts, you can slow the conversation down and at least express an interest in doing some type of evaluation of the training you're, you need to implement. My concern with this is not for larger agencies that really have a capacity to partner with researchers. My concern is with smaller and mid-sized police departments um, that really are void of any partnerships with research. And so I think we need to, like you were talking about before, I think we need to look at this regionally, and I think that we need to look at this on a national level to help. I mean, there's 18,000 or more police departments across the country, and I think that has to be a consideration, regionalism and a national model. Yeah, yeah well said. Um, and um, it, it, I think where I think I want to go in this conversation next is to start to dive into some of the specific uh, interventions and policy changes that the article talks about. Before I do that, I just want to encourage our audience to please uh, feel free to send in questions you might have about sort of the general lack of evidence or the need for evidence that we're addressing here today or um, some of the specific areas that we're going to be getting into. As you send these in, we'll be queuing them up and at some point in this conversation, we'll switch to pretty much all uh, audience Q&A. So I encourage you all to send that in. Um, so, but uh, Robin and, and, and Chief Harold, I, I, as I prepared for, for today's conversation, and I remembered reading the IACP clips this morning and noticed that the state of New Mexico legislature passed a bill and the governor uh, signed it to implement and mandate body-worn cameras for all agencies in the state, um, which in many ways maybe is an encouraging step, something that's needed will improve accountability and, and transparency at a minimum. But recognizing what we're going to be talking about today in terms of the lack of evidence around clear evidence i should say around how body worn cameras might actually implement officer involved shootings or even use of force you know it really caused me to go and look at the legislation to see well did they did they just simply require it or did they put in place any expectations around how these body worn cameras would be implemented or how they would be used or the training that's associated with it um, so I was curious about that. And um, uh, it, Robin, in, in your view and in what you say in the article, it's really essential that strong management practices be in place as body-worn cameras are implemented. Isn't that what the, what the evidence essentially tells us? Right, absolutely. And, you know, out of all the reform areas uh, that I highlighted, body-worn cameras has the most evidence base. Um, mm -hmm. And Cynthia Lum and her colleagues did a great job summarizing what that body of evidence suggested. And I think there's a lot of benefits to body-worn cameras, but the very narrow and specific question of whether or not the use of body-worn cameras reduces officers' use of force, yeah. um, 
that is a, a mixed outcome. There were I think, 16 studies out of the 70 that they looked at that looked specifically at that outcome and they had mixed results. Does that mean that law enforcement agencies shouldn't move ahead with body-worn cameras? Absolutely not. There's lots of other benefits for those cameras. But if we're relying on body-worn cameras as uh, a mechanism to reduce officer use of force, we might then be surprised down the road to find that there's really not the impact that we had hoped for. There's a lot of reasons for this, I'm sure, uh, but it's just another one of those um, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't move forward. There's lots of other beneficial outcomes from using those cameras. Yeah. But if our, but if we are specifically focused on reducing officer use of force, it has to be a much more holistic approach than just putting a camera uh, on an officer's chest, right? We have to think much more holistically about what that means. And I'm sure, Chief, when you know you stepped into the University of Cincinnati Police Division, we already had body worn cameras. In fact, the officer involved shooting was captured on a body-worn camera. It certainly didn't prevent that incident. Um, you took it to a next level about what those policies had to be around those cameras. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and the work that you did there. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Engel. I, I think the most important thing is when body-worn cameras, I think I worry about the over-reliance of body-worn cameras. One, for an investigative tool for police departments. One is to portray a, an accurate picture of what happened. I don't know how many um, body-worn camera videos I've seen um, that if police executives are solely relying on that, tell an incomplete or maybe an, even an inaccurate picture of what actually occurred. So that worries me. And I think it's always gonna come down to the investigation, boots on the ground and the investigation. So body-worn cameras, if police executives just look at that as a piece of the puzzle, a piece of what needs to be done, but I have to agree with Dr. Engel. My experiences with body-worn cameras is it just needs to be one piece of the police reform conversation. Yeah, Chief, I was uh, struck um, as, as again as I was preparing for the conversation today that that I read in the article that in that incident that that the professor just mentioned and you talked about, you had an outside uh, firm look at the incident and say that it was entirely preventable, quote unquote. And then subsequent to that, you had two different juries look at that video and could not convict. So it just goes to show you how challenging it is, even with body worn camera video for us to that we may see things very differently. Right. Well, I, I think that that's a great example of people looking at body worn cameras and, and, and seeing different aspects of of what some people think are, is very clear. On that one, that was a very complicated uh, scene. And um, I think there is a lot of science to support why um, the jury saw what they saw. And so police executives just have to be very cautious about the, the tool. Yeah, and, and you mentioned there is a lot of science and, and I, I find it fascinating to read about this because surprisingly, many officers are supportive of body-worn cameras, maybe not surprisingly, but they are supportive of it at some point. Citizens and community members are supportive of it. We see some uh, indications and evidence that it, they may be beneficial in terms of reducing complaints, although we may not understand why. Um, but we see some positive benefits from this. In fact, I, I wanna mention the Police Foundation actually just produced a, a report um, on 10 years of body-worn cameras and, and uh, evidence and that you can find that on our website at policefoundation.org. We summarize some of the research that uh, Professor Lam uh, and her colleagues have, have gone through. Let me move now to um, use of force and de-escalation. And Chief, I'll start with you if that's okay. The article mentions a statement that was made in a professional uh, outlet back in 2017 about de-escalation training. The statement read, quote, by sending officers to de-escalation training courses, chiefs and sheriffs have risked these men and women becoming hesitant about using force. And while de-escalation concepts are practical and effective in some situations, they are useless and even dangerous in others, unquote. How do you as an executive um, that's responsible to both the community and to your officers reconcile that uh, with the demand for de-escalation training when, when there really isn't a lot of science for you to kind of depend on in your decision making? 
Yeah, I know there's not a lot of evaluation on de-escalation training and policing, but I came um, with a unique background in social work. And I th think the body of evidence with de-escalation in other professions like nursing and psychology and mental health intake work um, is overwhelming. The, the other thing is, is, I think that as I looked at my career, the best de-escalation was always by the SWAT crisis negotiation teams. And so I looked at that and I thought, and then I attended the training myself and I thought, to me, this is a, a common sense uh, approach. But again, the first thing I did is I talked to Dr. Engel and said, will you please evaluate this to see if it really works? So I think that's the key, right? But I came, I came to that with a very unique background. Um, and I don't think a lot of police executives think that there's no evidence in policing to support the training. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, and Professor, in your article, you talk about the ambiguity around what we mean by de-escalation training and what it actually consists of and how difficult that may have made evaluation in our field. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Well, um, first, the content varies dramatically across these types of training. The method of delivery, the dosage of the training, all of those things are, are vary so dramatically that if we're going to test the impact, you're really testing just that training and not the larger concept behind the escalation training. And I was thinking at the time, so you know, we decided that we were gonna move forward with different training. We were changing our use of force policy at the UCPD. I worked with the chief. We, we looked at lots of different types of training. And at the time I wished, wouldn't it be great for law enforcement executives to just have a document somewhere that said, here are the different core areas within a de-escalation training. And you should be looking for content that includes this, this, and this. But that document doesn't exist, right? We really don't know and we don't give good guidance to our law enforcement executives about what they should be looking for in a de-escalation training and what impact we might expect for that to have. So the chief was great. She allowed me to survey uh, officers before the training. They, they did the ICAT training, trained the trainer, um, and went forward with that with first ICAT training. We did surveys before the training, after the training, and then in a four to six month follow-up period. Um, and that served as a pilot test for then another larger study that we're just completing with the Louisville Metro Police Department, where we're gonna be able to look to see is there an impact on officer behavior as well? So as police executives are selecting these trainings, they should be looking at these four components, what's in a training. You know who else is doing it really terrific? Is a Tempe Police Department. Mm -hmm. um, they have looked all across the country, looked at the different components, developed a training that made sense for their agency, and they're having it evaluated um, by Professor Mike White. So, you know, that's a great example of how we can move the science forward. Speaking of the science on this, you, you say in the article that there have been some evaluations that found favorable effects, but others that found unfavorable effects. What did you mean by unfavorable? Yeah. And so when I'm talking about the evaluations, none of them were done in policing. We found 64 uh, evaluations of de-escalation training in the other areas that Chief Harold mentioned, mostly in nursing and uh, psychiatry fields. So, some of those studies showed that after the training, there was actually an increase in the use of uh, force or restraint to control a client, for instance. Um, so of course, unintended consequences. Now, there weren't that many studies to begin with, not all of the studies looked at that particular outcome, but there were at least a couple of studies that showed a little bit of a pause of, well, what are the unintended consequences here? Now, we can, think through, well, was it the training, was it the trainers, all these other things, but until we have a body of evidence to really concern against, we don't know. And the, the worst thing that we could do is move forward and not recognize that what we're putting out there is actually increasing the risk for citizens and officers. And again, recognizing that this was written in the fall of 19 and published in January of 2020, have there been any recent uh, uh, articles that you've seen or new research or science on this? Yes, absolutely. In fact, we did uh, add a section at the end of that um, of the larger, we did a, 
a systematic review of de-escalation training was published in Criminology and Public Policy. And we added in a section that talked about the new research um, moving forward in that area. And so I believe actually, didn't you just have uh, Scott Wolf and uh, Jeff Rojak on last time uh, we, talking about their work? We and did. Think they found with the T3 training, they found changes in officer attitudes, but no changes in behavior. Um, right. We're going to be moving forward. We're just finishing up uh, this evaluation of ICAT training with the Louisville Metro Police Department. Now, of course, that study has been ongoing. We began that study in February of 2019. The training concluded in November of 2019, and now we're just looking at the follow-up period. But in a few weeks, we expect to have findings released. Um, so that we can take a look at what was the impact on officer behavior. And uh, I'm, uh, I will just, I, I can't, I can't tell you fully uh, what we found yet, but I'm encouraged with the results. I'm encouraged with the concept of de-escalation training and helping to move that forward. That's great. And, and I appreciate you mentioning the, the, the prior episode that we had. Folks can find that on YouTube. I think we'll show you a um, a screenshot there of how you can access it. Uh, we had professors uh, Scott Wolf and Jeff Rojek on a couple of weeks back talking about social intervention training um, and some of the promising results from that work. Um, one of the things I found most interesting about that um, is the, the sort of the emphasis on deliberate and repeated practice as part of a training regimen. And that's a, that's a whole nother subject for another session on how we have trainings uh, for police reform. Chief, did you wanna make a comment on that? I did just because you brought it up and it's so interesting. My surveying at the University of Cincinnati showed the most interesting aspect to me was the dosage. How quickly, if you didn't interwind these concepts together with other policies, how quickly the officers forgot, you know, part of the training. And so it really came down to now, do I do the training every two months, every four months? Um, but it was most certainly interesting to me to see the diminishing return on the training, how quickly officers forgot the main part of the training. And yeah. so just something to think about moving forward. Yeah, yeah, great point. Um, and if I could just jump in, I'm sorry, Jim, I wanted yeah. to give you a plug, uh, Chief Harold, because one of the things that she did I thought was so insightful is on our traffic and pedestrian stop forms uh, that every officer has to fill out, they included questions about whether or not they de-escalated the situation and which tactics they used. Um, that serves as a twofold uh, component. One is a, a reminder. This is important for your work. Um, and just actually listing out the different techniques that you could use reinforces the training, suggests that this is important uh, in their work. So uh, I, I love that approach. And Oklahoma City is doing something similar, Oklahoma City Police Department. They, on their use of force form, require information about de-escalation tactics that were used and what the outcome was. And, uh, and the chief out there has kindly allowed me access to their data. So we're going to be able to take a look at it and determine what types of situations are more likely to lead to the successful use of de-escalation tactics. And won't that be important for folks to know in the field? Yeah, outstanding. What gets measured gets done, right? Yeah. That's great. And, that, and that's what we, when we talk about innovation, that's the kind of thing we're talking about that we need to be able to share that and replicate that. Uh, before I move to implicit bias training, I wanna go back to body-worn cameras. Um, John Black, who's uh, followed us on Facebook, um, sent in a couple of questions and I don't wanna completely miss some of those. So on body-worn cameras, he says, um, related to the cameras, could there be a possible misalignment with the solution, body-worn cameras, as to the perceived problem, reduce um, officer-involved shootings, versus a perceived tool in restoring trust, loss of confidence, um, uh, an evidentiary tool with its pros and cons misaligned with the need to build relationships and understanding. Any comments on that? I completely agree. I think that that, that as I mentioned before, the use of body-worn cameras have a lot of other benefits, and those are some of those benefits, right? Uh, rebuilding trust and legitimacy with the community. Um, and they also might have an impact on citizen behavior towards officers too, right? That's something that we have to consider as well. Um, and so those situations might uh, have changed as a result of changes in citizen behavior. So I think there's a lot of reasons to use body-worn cameras, um, but if we narrowly 
tie them to, we want to reduce officer use of force and this is how we're going to do it, I think it's problematic. Chief, what do you think? Uh, I, I agree totally. I think the interesting thing of all the reform efforts, if I ask every one of these Boulder police officers, do they want to keep the body worn cameras? Every one of them would say yes. And they feel it um, has done much more good than harm, which I find really interesting because when I first looked at the body worn cameras many, many years ago, I thought, wow, this is going to remove officer discretion. Um, but the officers, um, at least here in Boulder, love them. Yeah, it's really an interesting thing to uh, to watch, and I, I think you know this is I, I, it's a great time for me to just uh, to to put out a reminder on this. Our purpose in this conversation today, and Robin, I think your purpose in this article is not to suggest that we shouldn't do these things, right, or that calls for these changes and these reforms are ill advised. It, it, quite the opposite some of these things may be very, very important and worthy of doing and worth every penny of the investment that they bring. The problem is we just don't know. And the mismatch, the alignment, as John talked about, the alignment between the problem we're trying to address and the intervention, I was thinking about earlier today, it's like, to, it's like as if your doctor were telling you uh, that, you know, that baby aspirin would help you uh, address COVID, right? It's like a, just a complete mismatch um, between the problem and the prescription. And I think that's what we're trying to get at today. This is why research and evidence is so important in policing, because at a time like this, no one wants to be guessing, right? And that's the purpose of our conversation today. Um, so moving on to implicit bias training, um, probably at, for me, one of the most interesting parts of this article, I wanna be clear here as well. The chapter acknowledges very clearly our concern over racial and ethnic disparities that have existed for uh, decades. And the article, uh, Robert, says that we really struggle um, as you know, collectively in the academic world, the professional world, to understand the exact role that bias plays in disparate outcomes. In other words, do we know if the disparities themselves, which do exist, are the result of discrimination? Can you talk about that for a minute? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I got started in this area of research many, many years ago, a couple of decades ago, when we were first talking about racial profiling during traffic stops. And I started looking at the evidence um, and at the traffic stops themselves and doing a lot of reports for agencies. And what I found time and time again was racial and ethnic disparity in outcomes. But no, no real evidence that that was based on bias or discrimination. The reason there was no real evidence is because we simply couldn't measure it. It's not to suggest that, that, that bias is not driving these disparities. It's entirely possible that it is. But there's also many other possible drivers of disparate outcomes that are not linked directly to officer bias. And mm -hmm. so our intention is to reduce racial and ethnic disparities in police outcomes. That's what we want to achieve. If we focus our energy only on reducing officer bias, I suspect, again, at the end of the day, we won't be reducing disparities because there are other things that are contributing to these racial and ethnic disparities. And I, I sense that, once again, we're moving towards, well, we just need to train. If we just trained officers in implicit bias, then we'd be able to reduce their bias and reduce racial and ethnic disparities. And I think even the trainers uh, that engage in implicit bias training would tell you that it's not that simple. Yeah. It's not really quite how it works. Yeah, and, and let's be clear about what you say in the article too. I think one of your quotes is, uh, all humans are subject to some form of unconscious bias uh, that may impact perceptions and behaviors resulting in discriminatory decision-making due to the high rates of minority and citizen contact uh, with police, the, the impact of implicit bias in policing could be especially profound. Um, yeah. Implicit bias has been demonstrated in research using police as subjects. So in other words, there's no question that it exists, right? That's pretty clear. Right, absolutely. Um, and so the real question is, if we train officers in the science of implicit bias, are we going to change outcomes? And we don't really have any evidence 
either way to suggest that because we haven't tested in person bias training for police. Um, and and that, to me, I, you know, I, I couldn't believe it when we took a look at the research. Literally, there's not one study. So uh, I partnered with the Finn Institute uh, out of Albany, New York, and Rob Warden is leading a study with the NYPD. And here in just a few weeks, we'll be able to release those findings where we tested fair and impartial policing training with the NYPD to look at changes in officers' attitudes, their beliefs, their knowledge, um, but also the behaviors. And that will be forthcoming. We're trying to build the evidence base, but right now it just doesn't exist. Yeah. You you also mentioned something in the article that I think many of us wish that we didn't that we didn't have to read, which wasn't true, and that is that implicit bias training um, through some research has demonstrated that it may produce unintended consequences, including increased uh, bias. Can you help us understand what the science tells us about that, and is there anything at all we can do to prevent or mitigate it? Well, it, it's interesting. Again, this, this body of research is not in policing, right? This is studying implicit bias training with other subject populations, not in policing. And there has been a lot of work. Um, there was a, a study uh, that was done, a meta-analysis of over 500 studies that looked at implicit bias. Um, some of those studies and subsets, other folks in the, in the uh, psychology literature have looked at and, and demonstrated that there's what's called a rebound effect in some cases, where when you are producing this training, it actually increases the, the use of stereotyping. Um, and so that's not a true across the board, but there are some studies that are showing that. And so that's where the content of the training matters, the delivery, how often, the dosaging of this training, all of those things really are going to matter here because this is a situation where there could be unintended consequences that we most certainly don't want. And, and Chief, from your perspective, you know, hearing this, do you avoid the training because we don't know if it'll have a backfire effect or do you do it because it's so essential that we take every step to eliminate bias? I mean, what do you do? Well, it's such a great question. And I, I personally saw this at the University of Cincinnati. We had a block of implicit bias training. And then I thought I was doing the right thing by um, continuing this dialogue in very short segments of an hour to two hours with uh, equity officers. And I thought it would be fierce, the original message, right? You, you know. So what I found is that, like Dr. Engel said, um, there was almost a resentment. Um, I think it worked against me. And so I think we need to be so careful. You know, it was interesting, I just talked to two psychologists yesterday, and I'm trying to develop an implicit bias training that would be effective. And they basically said there's just not one, that we know the outcome. And so it puts me in a very precarious position. I mean, I have to do something, but the something could have a positive outcome. And I worry, just like at the university, will it have the opposite impact? And so I think there needs to be a lot of dialogue on this right now. And I'm really happy that people like Dr. Engel are really looking at this because it is so important. And I don't want to put a training on that's very expensive for police executives that really is going to have the opposite impact. And so I think it, it's really worthy of continued um, discussion and evaluation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the, the next topic I want to move on to sort of follows along with the article um, where you talk about early intervention systems, more probably more often referred to as early warning systems, though uh, at the Police Foundation, we prefer to talk about them in terms of their intervention uh, capability. And I, I think, Robin, this is a tough one. Um, there are a handful of studies that suggest some promise in EIS ability uh, to reduce future complaints uh, and to re possibly reduce force. But the questions about the research really call into question um, the strength of the findings. Is that right? And and what do you do? What do you recommend not to implement an EIS or to implement it and do so carefully? Well, again, I, uh, I should defer this to my colleague, Rob Warden. He's the one that led the study that sort of took a look at the body of evidence. Um, I suppose it didn't take them all that long because they found six studies. Um, and again, with such an important intervention that we have so little research and even the research that's there, the methods on it are not as strong as we would like. 
And so there's no real strong evidence base to suggest that this works. I think the biggest problem with early intervention systems is at what threshold do you identify or flag a problematic officer? So we had that software that we were using at the University of Cincinnati Police Division, but we're a smaller agency, about 74 sworn officers. So who are we comparing to? Where do you set that threshold? And what we found, um, at least I did, and then uh, Chief Harold came on a year later, but what I found was good, strong, uh, street-level sergeant oversight provided me better information than that software system. Now, that of course means you've gotta have the right supervisors in place and invest heavily in their training and expectations and holding them accountable um, in order to be able to flag problematic officers. So am I saying we shouldn't have a system? I, no, I wouldn't say that at all, but the system, I wouldn't rely on it as, the, as you have you know, an early intervention system in place so you're good. I don't think that that's true at all. Chief, what are your thoughts? I, I think you're right. I think the most important aspect of having a, a robust early warning system is to hold the frontline supervisors accountable to report up to the chief on outliers within the data set and to have an inspection um, policy procedure that we are ensuring that we were looking at that we are holding people accountable at least to interview and see, look at these individual incidents and to see what is going on and to, to allow the officer to understand the behavior as well. So I really, I support early warning systems, but um, I think it, it requires an accountability mechanism all the way up to the chief to make sure it's being done appropriately. Absolutely. If you put that system in place and then you have the accountability structure over it, then it makes sense to me. So, Professor, do you think is is there do we have sufficient research now, even in the absence of a system, right? If we're not talking about software, do we have sufficient research now to be able to go back to the chief and to the command staff and the sergeant that that is really the first line supervisor to say these are the things you need to be looking for and these are how you need to look for them? Do we know that other than the common sense aspect of it? I. I don't think so. I don't think the evidence base is really there. I do think there are common sense ones, right? And I do know that some minor, uh, when you look at minor infractions, um, they add up to a problematic officer, someone who might be experiencing stress at home, right? If, if the officer uh, comes in late, um, is not doing the types of things that he or she should, that might be a pattern of behavior. But I don't know that the science is really there to point to it. I think it's probably more based on the intuition and experiences of the practitioners. You might have a better thought. No, I think there's a lot of math involved. And, you know, I've been so lucky to have uh, researchers uh, working with me for so long. But I don't think, you know, even if you have a robust early warning system, the math may be wrong that, that trips the red flag. Um, so again, I think it all goes back to an investigative product um, that the frontline supervisor has to engage in. Yeah, we we don't have a uh, we don't have a graphic for this, but folks uh, that are interested can go to the Police Foundation website, policefoundation.org. We we did a paper for uh, the Commission on Accreditation and Law Enforcement Agencies talking about early intervention systems and. One of the things we tried to make clear in that um, in that article, which was written by uh, Dr. Karen Amendola, was the what are the criteria that we should be looking for and how to appropriately flag those criteria within the context of the work setting and the shift and the type of role that the officer plays. Um, the other thing I think was really important about this paper is that we said you don't need sophisticated software necessarily to do it, right? In a lot of agencies, this is something that could be done uh, you, you know, off off of a, an electronic format or even in Excel, right? Um, we did get a question that came in on um, de-escalation that I thought was interesting. If you all don't mind me jumping back for a moment. Um, so this, uh, this person says, I was a hostage negotiator. I believe de-escalation techniques are a great tool. There were many times where one officer could de-escalate a situation, but then a uh, another officer would arrive on scene and escalate the situation to a different level. Even with training officers, um, 
even with training, several officers just couldn't de-escalate the situation. Some officers considered it touchy-feely. De-escalation techniques don't just calm the situation down, but can give the officer a second to slow down as well. Can this be something to look for during the hiring process or academy training? Is the, the sort of innate ability of someone, this kind of kind of goes back to that social intervention training that we talked about in the last session, right? Do, are there some people that just naturally have better skills at this? Chief, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I think if you're in policing long enough, you know that there's some police officers that can talk anybody off the roof and there's some officers that can uh, make everybody jump. Um, and so that that is definitely correct. And, uh, you know, SWAT negotiations are some of the best de-escalation uh, professionals in, in the field. And I'm always confident when they show up, they're going to slow everything down and they're going to they're going to personalize it. And it always turns out much better. So it would be very interesting to see if, if we could recruit those type of people. I, I don't know the answer. Maybe Dr. Engel has some more guidance on that. But that's definitely a valid point. Yeah, I think that police executives around the country are rethinking their recruitment efforts and what are the skill sets um, and the types of officers that they would like to have in the, um, join their ranks. Um, it's a difficult time for recruitment uh, and retention of police officers across the country. It was, it was difficult a couple of years ago. It's going to be even more difficult um, in the times to come. Uh, but finding that right skill set, I think, it is going to be important, and we need to continue to invest in research that looks at these types of things to better understand. You know, the concept of time, distance, cover, specifically trained and de-escalation skills um, and tactics. It seems to me that you do have the right. You have to have the right personality to be able to execute those well. Um, so even with training, we need to be looking at other attributes of law enforcement uh, officers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, very quickly, um, civilian oversight. Um, the 21st Century Task Force on uh, Policing recommended uh, civilian oversight to review incidents. Um, they can increase transparency and build accountability. Um, here again, though, Robin, we can't offer a lot of guidance on this. Is that right? That's exactly right. And now, again, this is one of those, well, does the solution match the problem? So citizen oversight is going to provide a lot of other very beneficial um, outcomes, right? It, it provides a sense of legitimacy, it could help build police community relations, um, but is it going to actually reduce officers' use of force? Uh, likely not. Um, the evidence just isn't there to support that. And one of the things that we know about, uh, about citizen oversight is it comes in so many packages and forms. There's nothing consistent about it. It is so incredibly localized. So what might be working and effective in one community may be completely ineffective in another. Uh, and so of course then building a body of research is really challenging in that way. So you have to understand what are the core components that should be included within that citizen oversight that we think would have the most impact. Um, and putting that together, packaging that, for communities, for policymakers, and for our practitioners. Uh, but that just simply doesn't exist at that point, at this point, and we need to do that. Yeah, the, the organization, NACOL, uh, NACOL.org, um, has a website that I, I would recommend everybody visit. They've got a couple of publications out there that really summarized the challenges in this area well. Key point being that you, you've seen one, you've only seen one in terms of civilian oversight models, right? There, I mean, there are some commonalities across these different models, but there's so much variation um, that it's very different. And we have not had the ability in part because of that to really understand how they can be effective. So um, I just realized time is getting away from us. So uh, we've got a few more minutes left. I wanna wrap up, Chief. I, I wanna sort of ask you one of the last questions. What's it like to be a chief in an agency today, accountable for running it effectively, but with little science to really support your responses to some of these things. And then at the same time, being given a mandate to implement some of these things that you know may or may not be effective and may make the problem worse. I mean, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's very challenging right now. Um, I definitely see a gap between research and, and police practice. 
I definitely think it should be part of the police reform movement. I think people need to understand how academics can help police frame, how they can help study. I have been so lucky in my career to be um, associated with really good researchers, including Dr. Evil, but I can't tell you the importance of this nationally to get in front of this, and it has to be included in the police reform movement because it is so challenging as a chief to have this expectation that we stop these bad incidents from occurring without a partner um, in research and to help us guide these critical decisions that we have to make. And I think researchers are so eloquent at framing these issues to city councils, to political leaders, and to the community. And that's the power of the relationship and partnership. And so hopefully we won't forget this moving forward because I think it's it's fundamental to change. Yeah, thank you, Chief. And we appreciate what you're doing there. Um, Professor, the, one of the questions that came in from the audience from uh, Noel Lewis is what, what is an example of a reform measure or intervention that is highly supported by evidence? Boy, um, I'd be hard pressed to find one, to be honest. Um, not to say that they don't exist. I think we have very good anecdotal evidence about a lot of things. Is it scientific? Is it empirically based? Not necessarily. We have a whole body of what I call best practices. These best practices are shared among law enforcement executives and shared from communities and, and policy and decision makers. Um, but unfortunately, they're not based on a strong body of evidence. Um, so we, we need to catch up. We, the research community, has a great list ahead of us. Um, and we're fortunate that there are some young folks right now that are passionate, that want to get involved. We have young researchers that are willing to take this on, get out of their offices, work out in the field, roll up their sleeves and do something meaningful. I'm working with a couple of those folks right now. My co-authors on this piece, Hannah McManus and Gabrielle Zaza, are great examples of that. And there's going to be more of those researchers moving forward. We just need also the police executives to open their doors, start making these partnerships so that we can move together, uh, you know, move forward and make these encounters safer for citizens and officers. Well, we couldn't agree more, but but hearing you say we just need police executives to open their doors and and work with us, I, I can't help but miss, or can't help but uh, to not miss the, uh, the potential conflict there between what we're asking and what we need of police executives like Chief Harold and many others and of their departments at a time when they're facing the defund police movement and yeah and budgets, and I can tell you from our own experience, asking agencies to give us data for research or to take surveys, that's gonna be the first thing going out the window. And oh, I know. You know, it, this could be a, a tragedy upon a tragedy. So- yeah. uh, it's challenging times for sure. Um, and we, we can't walk away from the need to help our, our practitioners uh, move this forward. We just have to keep pushing. Yeah. So well, this has been a great conversation. And uh, what I hope everyone takes away from this uh, is how important research and science are to policing reform. Let me say that again, policing reform and how little we actually know about what many of us are demanding or expecting today and every day. Of all the recommendations and demands that I've read about in recent weeks, uh, I can say with confidence that no more than a, than a few have called for more research and evaluation. Let me be clear, the National Police Foundation is calling for more research and more evaluation, and it matters not to us who does it, uh, but it does matter how it's done and that it's done. It is essential uh, and could not be more urgent as cities, states, and counties prepare to spend millions implementing reforms at the same time they cut the very budgets that allow the research environment to exist. So I hope everyone will join us uh, for future conversations. Uh, maybe we'd love to get both of you back to, to talk about this more. Um, this event today has been recorded and will be on YouTube uh, for folks to watch later. In closing, I wanna thank both of my guests today 
uh, for helping to bring research to life. So Chief Harold, Dr. Engel, thank you both very much. And I hope you both have a great week and wish you the best. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr.